Love and Light. This is Healthy Talk Show for Monday, May 20th, 2019. I'm Robert. And I'm Marissa. Healthy Talk Show records live on Mondays at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 3 a.m. UTC over at HealthyTalkShow.com slash live. Come join our conversation, chat room, and we record live, so it's fun. Come on over. Troll us. It's fun times. HealthyTalkShow.com slash live. Show notes for everything with links of everything we talk about will be located over at HealthyTalkShow.com forward slash 21. We are finally 21 years old. <laughs> we, I'm very, very happy about that. Healthy doctor the show can is, drink. <laughs> yes, we can legally drink. We can smoke in some states. True. Depending on the state. I think all states you can smoke. No. Oh, Cigarettes. It depends what you're... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cannabis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. More on that later. Show housekeeping. We're moving really soon. So that means we'll be missing one or two episodes. We're trying to get some pre-filled content in there, but we don't know how we're going to do that yet. Yeah. Studio's coming down, I think, the first week of June. And I think, we're yeah, June 3rd is yep. the plan. HealthyTalkShow.com slash schedule. If you want to keep up with what we're doing live, we do live streams every now and then. Not really anything interesting yet, but hey, we do what we can. Anything else? I don't think so. We got a great show, though. Oh, absolutely. Great episode. We have 5G fake news, poor FDA oversight in the drug industry, and we ask the question, or... The question's been asked, when does life begin? But first, KPIC CBS, San Francisco Bay Area, autopilot was in use before Tesla hit semi-trailer. This is now the fourth fatal crash involving a Tesla with autopilot turned on. And the details of this one, autopilot crashing into the side of an 18-wheeler, the car going underneath and getting the top sheared off. This is not the first time that it's happened. In fact, the details are eerily similar to another crash that happened just three years ago. According to the NTSB, back on March 1st, the Tesla was traveling on this Florida highway when the truck pulled out of a driveway to make a left turn and crossed right in front of the Tesla. The preliminary report says Tesla's autopilot system was active at the time of the crash. The driver engaged the autopilot about 10 seconds before the collision. From less than 8 seconds before the crash to the time of impact, the vehicle did not detect the driver's hands on the steering wheel. This is all that's left of the red Model 3. It went under the truck, practically shearing off the top half. The impact killed the driver. I found the Fast and Furious something like that's not possible because I saw them go under a semi once. Yeah. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. 50-year-old man, but the car kept on going another third of a mile. Crash data and video from the forward-looking camera show the car made no evasive maneuvers. Holy Jeez. moly. Jeez. That's scary. And thank you for the chat for pointing out the pre-stream thing. I turn it off. Pro, pro mode. Pro mode. Carrying on from this report because actually this is similar to one that was back in 2016. The details from this year's crash are very similar to an autopilot crash back in 2016. The 18 wheel tractor trailer, seen here colored in blue, turned left across the freeway. The Model S, colored in red, struck the trailer, passing underneath it, again shearing off the top half of the car. Oh my God. Today, Tesla released a statement that says, in part, autopilot was first engaged by the driver just 10 seconds prior to the accident, and then the driver immediately removed his hands from the wheel. Tesla drivers have logged more than 1 billion miles with autopilot engaged, and our data shows that when properly used by an attentive driver, who is prepared to take control at all times, drivers supported by autopilot are safer than those operating without assistance. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I thought they were supposed to be autopilot. Yeah. What's, I think... the, what's the auto part? Yeah. Yeah, it's and not they... auto. It's assisted pilot or... Neither the data nor the videos indicated the driver or autopilot system braked or tried to avoid the trailer, the report stated. The Model 3 was going 68 miles per hour when it hit the trailer on US 441, and the speed limit was 55 miles an hour. The report said Tesla said in a statement Thursday that Banner did not use autopilot any other time during the drive before the crash. Vehicle logs show that he took his hands off the steering wheel immediately after activating autopilot, the statement said. Very weird. Very strange indeed. Well, something else I found interesting from that Washington Post article. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they they said that the Tesla system was slower than other systems, and unlike system that systems that Consumer Reports have tested from General Motors and other companies. Interesting. Aren't they supposed to be the cutting edge? <laughs> Thought so. And then they also <laughs> say, uh, so this in addition to the previous crash, cash that. Da- cast doubt on Musk's statement that Tesla will have a fully self-driving vehicle on the road sometime next year. 
And uh, Musk said last month, Tesla had developed a powerful new computer that could use artificial intelligence to safely navigate the roads with the same camera and radar sensors that are now on Tesla cars. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. <laughs> if, if these trucks are having issues seeing the big semis, because I don't know, the reflection, or I don't, I'm not sure what the excuse is, but. Yeah, I don't see it coming, and that's what we touched upon last week. And we keep touching upon it, and people call us haters, 5G haters, or not 5G haters. Sorry, jumping to the next story. <laughs> well, <laughs> AI five, haters. But 5G and AI kind of go hand yeah, in hand. That's why I just say yeah. 5G AI saves us all. With Elon this, Musk save us, save the world. And I guess you know you could argue if that truck was connected to the 5G network and they were talking to each yeah. other when it happened, but you can't. You know, predict every scenario, not Drop everything. packets. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you have <laughs> bandwidth, you have wireless. Oh, it's... that packet got dropped. Oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah. The person's dead. Uh, we good? Yeah, I think that brings us to our 5G All story. Right. <laughs> New York Times, your 5G phone won't hurt you, but Russia wants you to think otherwise. The Russian network RT America aired the segment titled A Dangerous Experiment on Humanity and covering what it guest expert calls 5G's dire health threats. U.S. intelligence agencies identified the network as a principal meddler in the 2016 presidential election. Now it is linking 5G signals to brain cancer, infertility, autism, heart tumors, and Alzheimer's disease. Claims that lack scientific support. Analysts see RT's attack on 5G as geopolitically bold. It targets a new world of interconnected futuristic technologies that would reach into consumers' homes aid national security, and spark innovative industries. Already medical firms are linking up devices wirelessly to create new kinds of health treatments. RT's assault on 5G technology are rising in number as the American wireless industry begins to erect 5G systems. In March, Verizon said its services will soon reach 30 cities. cities. Let's remember that. Verizon. Verizon. Let's remember Verizon in this. All right. RT, explosive New York Times, 5G ties uncovered. Rick Sanchez lays into New York Times, baseless and intellectually lazy attack on RT's America's coverage of potential health hazards posed by 5G radiation. And here's a clip. Here's the coverage that, yeah, let's just listen. Here's a sample of the coverage that they're criticizing. All the effects that I just listed, those are some of the effects that are known according to the technology that's being seen today. So. What happens when we roll out the next technology, 5G? How much more powerful is 5G? How much more troublesome might it be? The issue with 5G is that it will be impossible to walk outside without exposing yourself to this radiation because right. these small cells... It's true. Yeah. Towers are going to be everywhere. Now, Rick, you asked how we got here. We got here because the FCC, the organization that is supposedly supposed mm. to be regulating the wireless industry, has been completely captured by the wireless industry itself. <laughs> we know that the so called public servants or our representatives and all these government entities have really been captured by the wireless industry. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. Now, that wasn't an accurate representation, though, so I will I would say RT bad on you because the. Even the New York Times piece goes into more. He brought on some experts and whatnot. I'm not really trying to support RT or I'm just upset that New York Times, their headline says, your 5G phone won't hurt you. They don't know that. Yeah. So, and now they're they're saying that the Russians are, <laughs> I don't know. But yeah. let's listen to RT, explosive New York Times, 5G ties uncovered. Conflict of interest might be an understatement for the New York Times and its relationship with the telecom giant Verizon. The Times does advertisements for Verizon. Take a look at this one. Paid for and posted by Verizon. Wow, that's weird. In their anti-RT 5G yeah. article, they mentioned Verizon rolling out 5G. Yeah. That's it, incredible. They didn't mention other companies, did yeah, they? Yeah, they, they love Verizon. <laughs> Verizon. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. This January, with Verizon's support, we're launching a new journalism 5G lab at The Times. Now, this lab's going to be based in our main newsroom. And it'll work very closely with Times journalists in New York City, across America, and around the world. So one, probably the U.S.'s largest 5G supplier, whatever you want to, provider, Verizon, is partnering with the New yeah. York Times. And then they write a story anti-RT because RT ran a piece that's anti-5G. Very suspicious. <laughs> Interesting. It'll partner with Verizon's Open Innovation Group and get early access to 5G technology and equipment. 
Doreen Tobin has been on the New York Times Board of Directors since 2004. Until 2009, she was Verizon's Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. After her retirement from Verizon, Tobin was given $3.5 million and then signed a year-long consulting contract that paid her a whopping $125,000 per month. <laughs> That's a lot of money. That's crazy. $125,000 a month, not a year. Yeah, that was, that's a lot of money. As for the article's experts on 5G, Ryan Fox spent 15 years at the National Security Agency and was a computer analyst in the U.S. Army. Now he's an executive at the cyber intelligence firm New Knowledge, the very same firm that ran what its own internal report called an elaborate false flag operation <laughs> in the 2017 Alabama special Senate race. And then there's Molly McHugh, the neoconservative what? think tanker and registered foreign agent who once wrote that fighting a new Cold War would be in America's interest. So whose interest does this article serve, the American public or corporate shareholders? Reporting in Washington, Dan Cohen, RT. Wow. And that's a good question. <laughs> new York Times should be critical of 5G. Yeah. If anything, it's... Or at least ask questions. But they don't. That's true. And another thing this kind of leads into is the whole fake news stuff. Yeah, and everything. If you don't agree with it, yeah. it's fake news. Fake news, fake news. Now they're just calling each other fake news. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and But that's also why I don't advocate for any sort of censorship because, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're both supposed to be news yeah. organizations. But the New York Times is supposed to be the paper of truth. That's when true. When you go to RT but, on YouTube, it says funded by the Russian government. Blah, blah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. New York Times is supposed to be, oh, we're honorable, we're the you know, paper of truth. It's the, it, uh, if they're partnering with Verizon, you, they can't be credible on 5G. Yeah. They really can't. They can't. Well, that's the problem with advertisers. How can you speak against your advertiser? Which is why we don't have any advertisers in Healthy Talk Show. Exactly. It's value for value, healthytalkshow.com slash support. If you want to give us money, help support us. That'd yeah. be nice. Appreciate it. And we've gotten some support from yes, our chat. Our chat. But, gives us support. But this goes back to that, you know, since people aren't even questioning the 5G, how are we going to get traction for some research, too? Yeah. And we need independent research, not run by Verizon. But, and because physicians and scientists, you know, they're saying we don't know the effects. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of unknowns. We've covered them before. Yeah. But it's, it's, you should be allowed to question. <laughs> yeah. But not when there's commercial interest. These telcos are huge. Yeah, that's kind of worrisome. Cause a lot it's, of money there. It's your health that's at yeah. risk. And I guarantee you, when you get 5G, your phone bill will go, will go up. It'll be more yeah. expensive. It's just a way to charge you more money. That's also true. Why can't we just stick with 4G and make it cheaper? Why can't for, we bring the cost of 4G down to $5 a month? <laughs> you know, why do we have to roll out this new... Ah, yeah. Such, 4G is so fast. All right, one more RT story. CNN also ran this too. What you need to know about LED lights. So this basically confirms past research. It's one of it, it's coming out of one of France's health agencies, and they're telling us that the blue light from LED lights are toxic for our retina. It can accelerate the aging of retinal tissue, hmm. and this of course contributes to bad eyesight and also progresses degenerative diseases. So lights on your phones, tablets, uh, laptop screens, those don't damage your eyes as much as perhaps the industrial LED lights that you would see in an industrial space. But still, if you have chronic exposure to this, it, it has pretty um, insane health effects. And insane. the main thing that we're learning here that. is that it just insane health effects. Come yeah. On. What does that even yeah, mean? Yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> disrupts your body's biological rhythms, these circadian rhythms, yeah. which is your body's natural hormone cycle that tells you when it's time to be awake, when it's time to be asleep. When we disrupt these rhythms, we also aggravate a whole slew of metabolic disorders like cardiovascular disease, hmm. some forms of cancer, and diabetes. I believe that 100%. You need, most people need to sleep in darkness. Yeah, and there's been research that supported that, I yep. think. RT, how blue light affects you. Yes. Uh, I'm staring at this thing all day right. long. So, is this an LED light? Yes, yeah, so that's an LED screen that does have blue light in it. All of our screens have this type of light. And basically what's happening within our brain is that when our photoreceptors pick up blue light, it's a sign that it's daylight. It's time to be awake, right? Mm. And when they don't, it's a signal that it's time to sleep. And then we produce melatonin, which is the hormone that helps us sleep. So when we're staring at screens, to, um, a lot of the time at night, in the middle of the night, or even in the evening, we're basically tricking our bodies into thinking that 
when it's daytime and we delay this melatonin production. Yeah. Yeah. Remedies. A few things from the oh. article. Yeah. Oh, I, was... I have remedies. I'll play that after. Okay. Because there, there is a, some conflict of what is exactly damaging. So some people say mm -hmm. that it's only at uh, higher intensities, so below 455 nanometers. But then now people are worried about the long-term consequences. So they're saying, you know, if we had very limited screen time, it may not matter. But the fact that we're on our phones all day, eight hours a day for, you know, our entire lives, what no one really knows what the long-term consequences yeah. are. And that's exposure in the higher ranges. Uh, and that could increase the risk of eye disease. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd really hate to see the effects of VR. Oh, that's because an those, that's a screen point. right up yeah. in your right up here. Yeah, that's why I don't roll with VR. I was always taught you're not supposed to have screens too close to your face because your eyes have to focus and you need to refocus. That's but true. I don't know if that's true. Yeah, I was taught I some weird that. things. But All right. um, so, what about your yellow glasses? Yeah, well, the remedies. Let's go. So there are actually a number of remedies. Um, the one thing that this uh, French agency basically cast doubt on are the glasses that I have here, which basically claim to filter out the blue light. They may do so a bit, but not all the way. It's not going to harm you. Like, really? It's not going to do. Can I try? You're not going to perceive a difference, I don't think. But, really? but definitely can, try. I mean, those definitely are not yellow ones. <laughs> Yours are really yellow. Yeah, I have really yellow ones too. Really, really yellow ones. But if I look at my computer right now, it's, if I look at my laptop? It's pretty much imperceptible because this is literally imperceptible light. It doesn't but make a damn difference. Literally make a imperceptible light. Eye, correct. Right. But basically, that does, what? It's what does that mean? Your eye is still taking it in, though. Yeah. <laughs> you still see. I'm... They claim that it, it, it slows it down, which is good. Um, the main thing that we have to think about here is that when you're about to go to bed, don't stare at your screen. So any light, like the wider, yep. the colder the light, the higher Melted. proportion is, there's blue in the spectrum, that's a higher risk. The mm. lower risk, of course, comes with these devices that we use every day, but since we do use them every day, in fact, American adults spend over 11 hours She's got you. Um, consuming some got sort you of media, usually with screens, uh, we should definitely look out for this type of thing. And so that number of... So kind of scary. Yeah. Also, I like how animated he is where he has to grab the laptop. Oh, yeah. He's a very animated guy. He's very, he's <laughs> so very entertaining. Funny. Yeah. He's very entertaining to watch. But, yeah, there wasn't really much uh, consensus on those yellow light blocking glasses either. Yeah. The which results is... were pretty mixed, so. And there's just so many different ones out yeah. there, too. They have the Gunner, and then there's another brand out there that's even more expensive, and then there's the cheap brand that I wear. And you mentioned how, yeah, they have various different tintings, too, because some are more clear, and then some go all the way to that really dark yellow one you have. So I would assume that the dark yellow ones are more effective. More effective. But they At didn't least really blocking out some kind of light because they're shaded. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. You good to go? Yeah. Cool. Time for the trans community. Snapchat's gender swapping filter is complicated. While many acknowledge that the filter is fun, for some it's been jarring to see their social networks manipulating their gender so casually. Others have said that they are concerned that some people are using the filter in problematic ways. Kyle Keegan, assistant professor of women, gender and sexuality studies and liberal studies at Grand Valley State University and a trans man, says that he wasn't particularly excited to see that feature. Playing with gender has always been a major part of trans culture and representation, Keegan said. Trans people have appeared for a long time in circuses, drag shows, and in Hollywood. These shows are fetishistic, but they can give trans people some control over how they're represented, he says. This also isn't the first time that the internet has helped people see what they look like as another gender, said Keegan. Older apps such as FaceApp have allowed people to change their appearance of their gender. Keegan said that he was not only troubled by the videos that played the idea of trapping. When a person is wooed by a person... Why, when a person is wooed by a person of one gender who turns out to be another gender, if, a trans, if trans people are accused of trapping, it can be deadly, said Keegan. It's a privilege to be able to play with being a different gender. Very interesting piece. Yeah. There's a lot more if you want to read more, but that's just interesting. Cause that's kind of, that, I'm, I don't consider myself a sensitive person, but that's the first thing I thought of when I started seeing that filter pop up. Yeah. Well, I noticed people posting and it was, yeah, it was definitely kind of strange. Very like, insensitive, I, I think. Yeah, because they are so casual about yeah. it. Like, uh, this, yeah. This is a big deal for some people, yeah. that they're struggling with their identity. Exactly. It's so. not. 
I. But again, <laughs> yeah. Uh. And then, well, something else the article pointed out mm-hmm. uh, was how the app turns users into extreme simplifications uh, with cartoonish representations. That men have broad chins and facial hair. Women are posed in soft lighting oh, and have delicate did. features. Oh, and so. You know, it just oversimplifies the stereotypes of what need, men and women are. <laughs> I feel like it's more body issues, dude, for both sides. We need to get away from this augmented crap. Yeah. From these photos, from Instagram. Instagram should have no filters. It should be raw, straight up, real pictures only. Yeah. Don't You have to take the app through the Instagram camera, and the Instagram camera has, you can't do it. You can't edit the photo, nothing. It's just straight up, here's the picture. Bing. That's it. That's how you do it. Yeah. Get rid of all these problems. Because oh, I, I was playing with it and it did just oversimplify and yeah. like do my hair really weird as a girl. And Is that machine learning? Uh, probably. <laughs> but then I did notice that some people uh, did like it because they could see themselves as the opposite gender. Yeah. So I don't know. But again, it's a very, like you said, very simplified and very. Yeah. So. so I don't know. We'd love to hear more from you. Yeah. Feedback is always needed. Yeah. So. Ask at HealthyTalkShow.com. 509-878-3229. That's our phone number. HealthyTalkShow.com slash Discord if you want to join our Discord. You know, I, we still don't know how to use Discord, so if someone wants to come in and show us how to use it, we'd love that. CNBC. Why glasses are so expensive. According to a 2019 IBIS World Report, the top four companies operating in the U.S. account for over 60% of industry revenue following a decade of mergers and acquisitions. The biggest of them, Luxottica, has 40%. The Italian company is the largest maker of eyewear in the world. In the US, it captures huge shares of both the prescription eyeglasses and sunglasses retail market, owns several major retail- Look at that. Yeah, that's everything, isn't (laughs) it? Yeah, they own everything outside of Costco and Walmart, I think. ...has exclusive manufacturing and licensing deals with tons of designer labels, and owns iMed, one of the largest vision insurance providers. A Luxottica spokesperson told CNBC that the glasses industry is very diverse, including several discount retailers like Walmart and Costco. This is true. The same Ibis World report noted that the vast majority of consumers prefer value eyewear from such stores. Prefer? That's the only one you can afford. Yeah, that's the only one you can afford. There's not really... I, I just prefer whatever is most affordable. But okay. Still, with such large market shares and diverse holdings, it's worth examining this one company's power. And in 2017, Luxottica announced it would get even bigger by merging with Essilor, a French lenses manufacturer. The $49 billion deal further consolidated the eyewear industry, leading some to ask, will this help consumers or hurt them? I think we know the answer yeah. to that question. <laughs> I cut a lot out of this video because it's just... Yeah, I mean, uh, no competition. Yeah. What's the incentive to lower prices? Exactly. CNBC, brief history of Luxottica. Leonardo Del Vecchio founded Luxottica in Italy in 1961. The name is a combination of the Italian words for light and optics, and the company manufactured components and accessories for the optical industry. But Del Vecchio soon transformed the company from supplier to manufacturer. In 1971, Luxottica debuted its first house-made glasses line. This turned out to be a prescient move. Starting in the 1980s, glasses slowly transformed from a necessary medical device to a fashion statement for the face. That's Demi Moore and Bruce Willis, just FYI, Marissa. Oh, yeah. And that other person was Michael Caine, the old guy with the glasses, with the big black glasses. (laughs) I think I recognize him. Okay. Luxottica both drove and capitalized off this trend by partnering with designer brands to make lines of glasses and sunglasses. Under these licenses, the fashion houses send inspiration to Luxottica, which designs and manufactures the frames. The company first partnered with Giorgio Armani in 1988. 30 years later, its roster of partnerships sounds like a fashion week unto itself. Prada, Chanel, Burberry, Michael Kors, Ralph Lauren, Tiffany, Versace, Bulgari, and on and on. Luxottica also purchased seven... Holy moly. So yeah. They have all the expensive brands. And those are expensive frames. Yeah. They have all the expensive ones. Yeah. Several brands outright, like Vogue Eyewear, Ray-Ban, and Oakley. They own and- them outright. 
Dang. they moved into retailing, buying Lens Crafters, Sunglass Hut, and Cole National, which is the parent company of Target Optical, Sears Optical, and Pearl Vision. Wow. In total, Luxottica has about 9,000 stores worldwide. And that's not all. Their vision insurance company, iMed, has a network of 28,000 eye health professionals and covers 39 million people. And that's still not all. We're focusing on the US, but Luxottica has a major presence in the UK, New Zealand, Australia, Latin America, and of course, its native Italy, as well as manufacturing facilities in the US, Italy, China, Brazil, and two small plants in Japan and India. In 2018, Luxottica had net sales of just under 9 billion euros. That's about 10 billion US dollars and an increase of 22% since wow. 2013. They're doing really well. You know, I didn't realize till recently that it, it was basically a monopoly on these glasses companies. Yeah, outside of Costco and Walmart, it seems like. Yeah. A few competitors are doing well. Some competitors have managed to succeed. Zenny Optical, an online-only glasses retailer, began in 2003 and sells glasses for as little as six ninety-five, lenses included. Yeah, non -pres not prescription <laughs> lenses. <laughs> Let's get that straight. Yeah, this report that's a little misleading. Prescription lenses raises it to about the price of Costco. Yeah, which if you're gonna buy the glasses, might as well just go to Costco then. Is yes. so if you have non-prescription lenses, you're good. Another company, Warby Parker, began selling glasses starting at $95 in 2010. Warby Parker even uses technology that allows consumers to do their own eye exam using a computer and a phone app. The company says these prescriptions are reviewed by an eye doctor within a day, removing an actual eye checkup as a barrier to getting glasses. But some optometrists worry that this method oversimplifies prescriptions and puts consumers at risk of getting a faulty product. And it goes into... Yeah. Oh, it's not really an eye exam. And even the video on the app says it's not an eye exam. I think it's yeah. interesting that Warby is thinking outside the box on that. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool, but I do understand the concerns. Yeah. Since. Oh, yeah. And the, they had an optometrist on there saying, oh, you know, you can diagnose certain cancers through eye exams sometimes. Yeah. Rarely, but it's possible. You can diagnose a lot of different things yeah. you wouldn't think that's possible. Plus, you want to watch your eye pressure, too. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> you haven't been to an eye doctor and they... I have great eyes. Poof your eyes and nah. check your eye. Ah, mm. lucky. <laughs> no, no. Get, no, no eye doctor for me. Anything else on expensive glasses? It's a monopoly. Costco and Walmart seem to be the only ones that are out of it. I would recommend Costco. Yeah. We just got you fabulous. You're actually wearing a pair of Costco glasses I right am. now. But you know what's interesting is I can't use my insurance to buy Costco glasses. Yeah, because it's too <clears throat> expensive. What? Because <laughs> buying Costco glasses is cheaper than buying yeah. glasses through your insurance. Yeah, that's yeah. what's really jacked up yeah. because of how expensive everything is. Mm -hmm. God, I love Costco. Yeah. Democracy now. As EPA insists weed killer Roundup is safe, a jury orders Monsanto to pay $2 billion to a couple with cancer. A jury has ordered Monsanto, which is owned by German pharmaceutical giant Bayer, to pay more than $2 billion in punitive damages to Alva and Alberta Pilliard, a couple who were both diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer after using Roundup on their properties for over 30 years. The main ingredient in the herbicide is glyphosate and is said to cause the cancer. This is plaintiff Alberta Pilliard. We've been fighting cancer for nine years now, how longer than me, and it was caused by Roundup. Following up, EPA insisted safe. Earlier this month, the EPA said glyphosate is not carcinogenic. However, other scientific studies and the World Health Organization have found human exposure can in fact lead to cancer. <laughs> what do you think? We reported on that too, the EPA saying that. Yeah. I just wanted to remind people that the EPA says it's not, glyphosate's okay. Which is weird because, like they mentioned, there have been many studies. Yeah. It, which is. It, yeah. And they also mentioned, well, you know, obviously the evidence must be convincing to the jury. So yeah. even though they keep insisting that it's not. It, well, let's get into it. She, uh, Amy Goodman interviews the attorney on the case and he opens up some interesting things. 
Bayer, quote, Bayer is disappointed with the jury's decision and will appeal the verdict in this case, which conflicts directly with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's interim registration review decision released just last month. The consensus among leading health regulators worldwide that glyphosate-based products can be used safely and that glyphosate is not carcinogenic, and the 40 years of extensive scientific research on which their favor favorable conclusions are based. Uh, Brent Wisner, your uh, response to what Bayer has said. Well, it's the same. And he, he's the attorney on the case. Same response that they, it's the same thing they said to the jury. It's the same thing they've been saying for the last three years. And it's just simply nonsense. The simple fact is that the EPA has got it wrong on glyphosate. We have study after study after study showing that it, in fact, does cause a specific type of cancer called lymphoma. And we see it happening in thousands and thousands of people across the country. You know, currently, this administration and this EPA will not take action against Monsanto. We've seen the internal documents, the text messages, the emails between senior EPA officials and Monsanto employees. And the simple fact is... More on that later. Oh. <laughs> this is they know that this EPA will not take adverse action against them. It is a travesty that this truth about it causing cancer and this awareness that we're trying to erase has to be done in the context of litigation. We only exist, these lawsuits only exist because the EPA has failed the American public for 45 years, and Monsanto is allowed to get away with, with reckless conduct with essentially impunity. Wow. Oh, yeah. Back to those Monsanto emails he was talking about. During the trial, numerous internal Monsanto documents and emails came to light, including the July 2018 email from an analyst from the corporate intelligence firm Hacklute. The email read, quote, a domestic policy advisor at the White House said, for instance, we have Monsanto's back on pesticides regulation. We're prepared to go toe-to-toe -to -toe on any disputes they may have with, for example, the EU. Monsanto need not fear any additional regulation from this administration. What? <laughs> After this email became public, the Center for Biological Diversity asked the Trump administration for public records to assess the pesticide industry's influence on the EPA's proposal to reapprove glyphosate. Can you talk more about this, Brent Wisner? Well, it's really interesting. In the middle of trial, after we had rested our case in chief, but before closing arguments, out of nowhere, the EPA issues a rep an interim analysis. It was written by a an individual, Billy Mitchell, who doesn't have any higher or specialized education or training. And if you read the document, it literally reads like the opening statement for Monsanto during our trial. It was, it, it, Monsanto wants a report, EPA brings it. And that just shows <laughs> yeah. you just that the level of capture of this agency that essentially does not work for the American public, but works for industry. These documents from these, these corporate intelligence agencies they just show us just how deep it runs. And it's not just, you know, a political thing, but it's actually in the staffers themselves. The fact that the White House is telling Monsanto, we have your back, I mean, it just tells us that, that we're going to have to keep fighting this fight and that we are not going to get any support or help from the public agencies that, ironically, are supposed to be protecting the public health. Really interesting. Yeah. Monsanto is incredibly powerful. Most people don't realize how powerful Monsanto actually is. I... Nine, what, 97% of our food is Monsanto controlled or some yeah, something, crazy number? Crazy. Monsanto controls the food, our food, everything that's grown. It's crazy. Look into them. And they're, yeah. they're being sued for giving people cancer. Hmm. Well, it's just disturbing that our government seems to be protecting them more than the people. Yeah. So, but, but I'm sure it has something to do with the food supply. I don't know yeah. what it is. I don't know. Democracy Now, last clip. What happens to Roundup? And what happens to Roundup? We have 20 seconds. Uh, you know, hopefully we get a warning. We want people to know and have a choice when they use the product. Hey, does it cause cancer? They have a right to know. Should it be removed from the market? That's a difficult question. Um, you know, people still smoke cigarettes. We know they cause cancer. At the end of the day, this is America. People have a right to make a choice. Whether it gets removed or not, that's a different question. They deserve at least to know that it causes cancer. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Ask at LDTalkShow.com. Let us know. Glyphosate, Roundup, Monsanto. What do you know? What do you want to know? A lot of interesting things.
Anything else on that one, Marissa? I would just say, hey, at least we have our checks and balances. So the court system is yeah. trying to fight back on this one. Yeah. And we have public records and stuff. So Yeah. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. I'm yep. sure there'll be more. Anything Monsanto piques my interest every time I see that name cross my screen. Washington Post. PG&E power lines to blame for California's deadliest wildfire ever, officials say. Now, six months after the campfire incinerated much of this community, investigators have formally determined the cause. State fire officials on Wednesday said electrical transmission lines owned and operated by PG&E were to blame for the blaze. It started about 10 miles northeast of Paradise last November, but it's still not the full answer. Wednesday's statement stopped short of saying whether the San Francisco-based company was at fault for lapses in maintenance or how exactly the lines triggered the greatest loss of life from a single wildfire in the state's history. The fire raced through this town with little warning. Nearly 19,000 homes and structures were destroyed. 85 people lost their lives. A CAL FIRE spokesman said the investigation into how the equipment failed and whether there was criminal liability is still open. Ooh, very interesting. Dang. That was a bad fire. Yeah. <laughs> Being a California resident, I remember. So I didn't catch in that clip, but they didn't mention that that company filed for yes. bankruptcy, did they? Yep, carrying on. I think okay. PG&E says it hasn't been able to review the report, but it does I accept think. its findings on the origins of the fire. The utility company filed for bankruptcy in January. It remains under criminal probation for a deadly pipeline explosion in 2010. And it's a defendant in a number of private civil cases stemming from other wildfires. It's previously cited potential civil liabilities in excess of $30 billion. Holy crap. Yeah. I thought that was pretty cute how they filed for bankruptcy because they were anticipating billions of dollars mm -hmm. in liability claims. Yeah. So they they knew. They yeah, they lying. knew they were going down. Yeah. So bye. That's <laughs> kind of messed up. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, of course they mentioned that they were responsible for that Tubbs fire as well. So. Mm -hmm. Or at least yeah, it's. Well, except we're gonna they find out more them. on that because I remember when the fire was happening, everyone was blaming climate change. Yeah. Well, you can always blame it for making it drier, but it's still. It's the electric did, faulty yeah. transmission lines. Climate change did not ignite yeah. it. It did not ignite it. That's true. Vox. Why drugs cost more in America? Prescription drugs cost more in the United States than anywhere in the world. One big reason why America's particular system for how drugs gets to patients, which is unlikely. Almost. Ah, cut. One more time. Vox. Why drugs cost more in America? Prescription drug costs more in the United States than anywhere else in the world. One big reason why is America's particular system for how drugs get to patients, which is unlike almost any other countries. But it's also because the American prescription drug market is also so profitable that the money it generates powers the entire global pharmaceutical industry. Very interesting. In 2014, Zavaldi became the first drug to completely cure hepatitis C. Here's how it got to market in, for example, the UK. First, a government agency had to decide that Savaldi was safe and that it actually worked. Then it was evaluated by a regulatory agency to see if it was worthwhile. Are there too many side effects? Is there already a similar drug? Is there a cheaper option? Savaldi was deemed worthwhile. Next, they negotiated the price. In the UK, the government buys the stock of medicine for the country. That means they're usually able to get a lower rate, kind of like a bulk discount, which keeps prescription drugs cheaper for UK citizens. In almost every developed country besides the U.S., this is what the system looks like. Uh, I don't know about that, but we'll, we'll let the video play. Safety evaluation, assessment of whether the country needs it, price negotiations, sold to patients. But that's... In the U.K., that is how it works. Interesting. And fairly. I believe so. According to Vox. Yeah. How does it work in the U.S.? First, the drug is evaluated for safety, but that's it. If it's safe, they can sell it. End of story. Drugs are sold by the drug companies to patients, usually through insurance. And since the U.S. system lets them sell it for any price, Gilead, the company that makes Avaldi, charged Americans more for it. When it first came to market, the entire treatment cost $84,000 in the U.S. Whoa. In the U.K., just about $58,000 U.S. dollars. That's still a lot of money, but it's a full 30% less. It's still a lot of money, though. Yeah. Oh, my god. <laughs> it really gosh. is a lot of money. <laughs> 
especially with the taxes are higher. I don't know. A quick comparison. I actually like this video because it shows, yeah, you'll see. These photos are from protests in the US against the high price of EpiPens. And these are photos from protests in the UK over the lack of access to a cystic fibrosis drug called Orcombi. So high prices or access? High prices mean you get better access, but it's, lower it's pricing means you get less access. Yeah. So it's which one? But then if I you're like poor, that. you still don't have yeah. access. You know access. <laughs> That's because when there's a committee that determines whether a new drug is worthwhile, sometimes they say no. And when they negotiate the price, sometimes they don't come to an agreement and hit a standoff. That's what's happening with Orcombi. Both systems require trade-offs. Regulated drug markets tend to make drugs more affordable, but some drugs are completely unavailable. And while the U.S. has more drugs technically available, they're often too expensive to actually afford. Very logical. Yeah, but it's, it's so frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> the drug companies, last clip from Vox, why drugs cost more in America. But the commonality between these two systems is the drug companies. Developing new drug products isn't cheap, and they're for-profit businesses. If Gilead didn't think that researching and developing a hepatitis C cure would make them money in the end, they might not have. And with these regulated markets keeping costs down, the only place drug companies can really make their money is, you guessed it, the U.S. <laughs> Americans are essentially subsidizing the cost of drugs for the rest of the world. In other words, a big part of why prescription drugs are more expensive in the U.S. is because they're cheaper everywhere else. Very interesting. I really hope that's not true. <laughs> I'll be very upset. But yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Drugs are very expensive here. Yeah, it kind of makes sense, though, too. Mm -hmm. But research is really expensive. All the yeah. equipment. So it's a tough balance. But mm -hmm. at the same time, these companies spend a lot of money on other things, which we've covered. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so. What do you think? AskLTalkShow.com. NBC News. New regulations require drug companies to include price in TV ads. New regulations will require drug companies disclose list prices for any medications that cost more than $35 a month. Xarelto, the first to include its price at the end of this ad, $448 a Whoa. month. <laughs> yeah. Today, Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar saying drug companies must be more transparent about their pricing. If they're afraid that people will be scared off by their extortionate drug prices, lower your price. It's that simple. <laughs> but the drug industry says the list price doesn't reflect what patients actually pay out of pocket and could perhaps discourage them from seeking needed medical care. We don't see that as being a problem. The list price does not reflect what patients will actually pay out of pocket. Yeah. Well, why don't we make it a little less confusing then? I know. Why Why is everything such a secret? Too? Yeah. Because then you really can't negotiate and you have no idea of anything. Yeah, you don't know where you're going into. You know, knowledge is power. Yep. And we reported on that a while ago. I don't yeah. Know. It's, still, it's still making the rounds, so figured we'd revisit it because it's pretty funny. Science Daily. Opioid exposed newborns may react to pain differently after birth. Researchers from Penn State College of Medicine found that as soon as 24 and 48 hours after birth, babies who were exposed to opioids prenatally reacted more strongly to pain and scored higher on skin conductance test, which measures the electrical differences in skin in response to pain or stress. According to the researchers, op opioids block the release of norepinephrine, a chemical released in the body during times of stress. When the baby is born and is no longer exposed to opioids, the baby experiences a spike in norepinephrine and other chemicals and hormones in the body. This can result in such symptoms as irritability, eating poorly, sweating, fever, and seizures, among others. The researchers enrolled 37 newborns, 22 with prenatal opioid exposure, and 15 healthy controls for the study. To measure the baby's reaction to pain, the newborns were video recorded while undergoing a heel stick, a standard procedure that most newborn babies undergo to give blood for screening tests. To measure skin conductance, a non-invasive device with three electrodes was applied to one foot. The device measure electrod electrical conduct conductance in the skin, which can change when... Norepinephrine. Yep, norepinephrine boosts sweat production. I lost lost my train of thought. After the data was analyzed, the researchers found that the babies exposed prenatally to opioids had higher skin conductance and reacted more strongly to pain during and after the Hillstick procedures. Additionally, babies who had been exposed to opioids continued to be stressed after the procedure was over and they were wrapped and tucked in. I found that last part very interesting. Mm -hmm. They felt the continued pain. Yeah. Like they're hooked. 
Yeah, that's <laughs> really disturbing. It's extremely just, it's yeah. so quickly and just. Oh. Well, I mean, that's why they're trying to identify what babies do have this opioid addiction already because mm-hmm. they need all this extra support because of the issues. Yeah. You have to be ready. And like you said, knowledge is power. Yeah. Knowledge is power. And if you're enjoying all this knowledge and hopefully the power you're gaining, hopefully you find value. So healthytalkshow.com slash support to help support us financially. Yep. Or we appreciate feedback. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. We need feedback in any form. Ask at healthytalkshow.com. Yep. Send nudes. (laughs) Reuters, Vietnam culls 1.2 million pigs as African swine fever spreads nationwide. Vietnam has culled more than 1.2 million farm pigs infected with African swine fever, the government said. Pork accounts for three quarters of the total meat consumption in Vietnam, a country of 95 million people were Most of its 30 million farm-raised pigs are consumed domestically. The virus was first detected in Vietnam in February and has spread to 29 provinces, including Dong Ne, which supplies around 40% of the pork consumed in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam's southern economic hub. Woo! That's uh, Uh, bad. That is bad. On last week's episode, we talked about how hard African swine flu has already hit China. Here's a report on how China is dealing with pork shortages due to... African swine flu. Actually, I lost that report. <laughs> Never mind. I don't how did I lose that? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Uh, this is really worrisome. We're still watching it, of course. So it hasn't jumped to the US as of yet, but and also To make up for the oh. shortfall in supply, China is turning to imports, including pork from the United States, despite <sighs> Heavy tariffs imposed amid the current trade dispute in the first two. That is one of the most interesting yes. parts. I love that he said that he brought Just, up the trade dispute yeah. and the tariffs. I love it. Yeah, and we we mentioned this last week too. How Tyson stands to gain from this. So yep. Do you have more clip? I sure do. All right. Two weeks of April alone, it bought over a hundred thousand tons of U.S. pork, and that's almost twenty times more than purchased in the same period last year. In total, U.S. pork sales to China are predicted to hit a record 2.2 million tons this year. And that's in spite of those import tariffs that now stand at 62%. China's diminishing hog herd is also threatening the pharmaceutical market. The widely used blood thinner heparin is made from pig intestines, nearly 80% of which are typically supplied by China. Authorities Uh say a global shortage of the drug could result. Meanwhile, many countries, including the United States, are taking extra precautions with live swine and meat imports in an effort to stop the African swine fever outbreak from becoming a global pandemic. It's... (laughs) Damn. Yeah, I'm sure. It's getting scary for pork. Yeah. And pork production. And I didn't realize it was used in that. Yeah, vaccine. That's kind of worrisome, but... I'm sure we'll continue to keep an eye on this situation. Yep. You know any information? Ask at HealthyTalkShow.com or tweet us. <laughs> healthy, yeah, talk healthy Talk Show. Drop, drop the, the w. w. Or Instagram. Sorry, I couldn't remember if that was the right term. Like tweet us? Is uh, that what it's called? Yeah, tweet us. <laughs> I don't know. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> Good morning, America. New study looking at where old... What? Good morning, America. A new study looking at what ultra processed foods can do to our waistline. Just to be clear, explain what ultra processed foods are. So they're the foods, a lot of them that are right in front of us, chips, candy, white bread, even some breakfast cereals. They are typically very high in fat, salt, and sugar. They are what we call nutrient poor and calorie dense. And basically they're the things that we buy in the grocery store that can be stored in our pantry, long shelf life. Basically they can withstand a nuclear holocaust and they're not good for us probably not good for us yeah that's yeah true. uh here's a little brief study 30 seconds this was a very very important study funded by the national institute very, very of health important. it was very small very small all but incredibly good methodology very incredibly good methodology very well controlled they followed people in direct observation over a four-week period of time they matched them calorie for calorie and they found that the group that ate ultra processed food gained a pound a week and they were hungrier they ate more so again if you if they're eating the same amount of calories there's something in these foods that really mm, changes our body's hormones the way we eat, and it's a problem. all right what did she mistake because she, 
she should have clarified that they were presented with the same calories, mm -hmm. but they were uh, free to eat as much as they wanted. So they were kind of seeing like who filled up first and who like mm -hmm. ultimately ended up consuming the most calories. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have more clips? Nope, that's okay. it. So I'll, I'll go on to my other mm -hmm. criticisms. So what she should have said is they were being matched for calories and then also macronutrients. So they're trying to match for sugar, fat, fiber as well. Uh, but they admitted, while we attempted to match several nutritional parameters between the diets, the ultra processed versus unprocessed meals dif differed substantially in the proportion of added to total sugar, insoluble to total fiber, saturated to total fat, and omega-3 to omega six fatty acids so you know not it's not perfectly matched in all the macronutrients yeah I mean, probably because these processed foods have less fiber they're going to have more uh fat or sugars mm -hmm. um and then the length of the study was also fairly short yeah and then four weeks she wasn't joking when she said small it was mm -hmm. 20 participants oh yeah that's really small yeah and then so you're correct they did the four weeks mm -hmm. so they would have one group they would they would start with the processed diet the other half would do the unprocessed diet and then they would kind of swap but you know weight can kind of fluctuate so we don't really see the long-term effects of these diets although you know i don't think anyone is arguing that processed foods are good for you yeah I don't. well <laughs> unless maybe the manufacturers yeah but you know they they didn't look at calories because it is also calories in versus calories out mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's just that if you eat unprocessed foods you tend to fill up probably due to the extra fiber and then that prevents you from overeating mm. um, something that they didn't really address but they did kind of imply so they mentioned the cost of these ingredients so that it was the cost to prepare 2000 calories a day was estimated to be 106 for the unprocessed versus 100 or sorry, 100 versus the process versus 151 for the unprocessed. So eating the unprocessed was more expensive. So that goes back to what people, you know, usually argue that mm -hmm. poor people end up eating this faster, uh, more processed, bad for you, fast food. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of difficult. It's difficult. What about Soylent? You know, some people are saying that those protein powders are not good for you. Yeah? Yeah, that the long-term health effects may be detrimental. Because I remember the argument from our guest Genesis on Soylent and the way he lives is because it takes, it's less for the body to break down because it's already processed. Yeah. Something like that. I don't know. There's some contradictory studies, so. I don't know. We may have to do a deep dive. Maybe. Or let us know, com. Maybe. Or maybe I'll do an experiment myself. CBS Philly. Philly soda tax study sees cells dip. Public health um, impact unclear. 83 million fewer cans of sugary soda sold in Philadelphia one year after the tax was added to sweetened beverages. That's according to a new study from Penn Medicine. Really great news for public health. Christine Roberto was part of the research team at Penn. Health outcomes were not measured specifically in the new study, but she says sweetened drinks have contributed to the obesity epidemic and several other health problems like heart disease and diabetes. Sweetened beverage tax in Philadelphia led to a 51% drop in tax beverage sales in the city, but we see that some people did cross the city line to buy those drinks and avoid the tax, about 13 percent. It ends up being a 38 percent drop in soda sales from nearly 300 supermarkets in and around Philadelphia. 13 percent left the town to, to go buy soda elsewhere. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> what opponent, what an opponent says. The soda tax has generated more than $130 million for free preschool programs in the city, but opponents say the tax has had a negative economic impact. A statement from the American Beverage Association says, in part, this latest study verifies why a majority of Philadelphians want this tax repealed. It has caused punishing price hikes that have hurt working families and sent shoppers to stores outside the city. As a result, we've seen local businesses close and employees lose jobs. Taxes on common grocery items like beverages have never really improved public health. Very dramatic, and they yeah. respond. 
But the Penn researchers say they found no change in unemployment claims impacted by the soda tax. The Penn research published by the Journal of the American Medical Association today was funded by Michael Bloomberg's charity, which supports anti-obesity measures, including soda taxes. Jessica and Yuki? They support soda taxes. That's yeah. one of their, <laughs> their main bushes there, soda That's taxes. It's funny. number two bullet point on the website. Yeah. But it's, we were talking about this earlier, too, how the consumption rates had dropped before mm -hmm. the tax even went into yeah, place. Yeah, so. that was in San Francisco, I believe, that study was done. Yeah. I think in the Bay Area somewhere. So it's kind of interesting <laughs> Yeah, whether this tax was even really effective or... Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I like that, too, that they were going to the border. Yeah, to get... <laughs> it's pretty funny. Going to another town to get their soda fix untaxed. Hey. Breaking the law. You know, educate people, but, you know, let yeah. people do what they want to do. Let people it's, do it's it. their body. Yep. <laughs> CBS Evening News. New study suggests that women's breast cancer risk can decline by diet. Women who followed a balanced, low-fat diet had a 21% lower risk of death from breast cancer and a 15% lower risk of death from any cause compared to women not on a low-fat diet. We actually have information that is hardcore. Dr. Donna Marie Manassi is chief of breast surgery at Maimonides Medical Center. You have to decrease your fatty intake if you actively want to be positively affecting your survival from this disease. It's almost like a license to give a, to give a prescription now to see, a, to see a nutritionist and to change your diet. The 20-year study followed nearly 49,000 postmenopausal women who did not have breast cancer when they enrolled. One group adopted a lower fat diet with daily servings of fruits, vegetables, and grains and cut fat intake to about 25% of total calories. The control group continued their normal diet with fat accounting for about a third of total calories. The study suggests that dietary changes don't have to be drastic to have a lasting impact. Dr. Tara Narula, CBS News, New York. Very good. Yeah. Anything on that? Uh, yeah, back to eating I, healthy. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't think we're surprised. Just more yep. reasons to eat be, eat healthy. Yep. Avoid cancer. At least try to. Yep. You want to talk about some intermittent fasting? Let's hear it. Cynthia is a Western medicine trained nurse practitioner and functional nutritionist who is passionate about female hormonal health. She believes that the inherent power of food and nutrition can be the greatest asset to your health and wellness journey. She did a TEDx. Eating all day long over taxes our pancreas and our digestive system. It overtaxes it so much that it cannot work properly. And if it cannot work properly, we cannot absorb our food or the nutrients in that food. Another really important distinction when it comes to meal frequency or how frequently we're eating is the debate over sugar burners versus fat burners. I've never heard about this debate, yeah, but I haven't it, either. It probably is a debate. <laughs> when we're talking about that, a sugar burner is someone that, that consumes lots of carbohydrates and taps into glucose as their primary fuel source, which is incredibly inefficient. If you recognize these individuals, they are frequently hungry, they often get hangry, they have significant, yes, significant dips in their energy level. They struggle more with fat loss and they struggle more with their weight because insulin levels are high. Insulin level or insulin is that fat storing hormone. So if levels remain high, we have more oxidative stress, we have more infl excuse me, inflammation, and we struggle more with weight gain. It makes so far yeah. it's the case against eating all day, a little bit more. In sharp contrast to this are fat burners. They tap into fat stores for energy. They have sustained energy. They are much more clear cognitively. They don't get hangry. They are easy, it's easier for them to lose weight because they tap into those fat stores. They sleep better and they age more slowly. So meal timing and how frequently we are eating is absolutely crucial. That's intermittent fasting. Yeah, I'm not sure about the age slowly thing. Because <laughs> the only thing I've ever heard of is calorie restriction with respect to longevity, and I we mm. talked about that with Genesis. So, oh, Swag Lord in the chat, I never get hangry. Is it just me? Do you ever get angry in general, or do you ever get hungry? <laughs> well, you know that's the other thing about hangry because 
I definitely get hangry, but I notice with our diets now that we kind of eat less carbs, mm-hmm. but we also eat more frequently. So that's yes. also why See, we that's don't... why I like this because intermittent fasting is telling you not to eat. It's supposed to eat during daylight hours. Oh, she explains it. We'll get yeah. into it, but I we eat every hour. Yeah, but we also eat yeah. just like a small like carrots or... Yeah. Okay, continue on. Let's talk about intermittent fasting. It is the absence of food during a prescribed time period. You exist either in a fed... Hold the phone. Why is there somebody texting in the bottom left corner right oh, there? Man. Look, food, oh, man. what the heck is going on? He's right in the camera texting. During a prescribed time... Oh, zoom and enhance. I want to see. I want to see what that yeah. person's doing. Zoom Auto and enhance. enhance. Auto times, enhance. Times 200. Period. Jeez. You exist either in a fed or a fasted state. I'm sure for many of you, you had breakfast this morning. So when you eat... Insulin is secreted by the pancreas to move sugar into the cells. We store the bulk of our sugar in, in our liver and our skeletal muscle. But when we exceed those storage sites, we store it as fat. When we're fasted, insulin levels are low and we can tap into fat stores for energy. Free, flexible, simple. And so, when we're talking about intermittent fasting, it, it's, it's fairly simple. If you skip breakfast, if you skip breakfast in the morning, you can reduce your caloric intake by 20 to 40%. And the, the typical time frame that I recommend to my female patients is a 16-8. I'm 16 sorry. 16 hours a day fasted yeah. with an eight-hour feeding window. I, I can't skip breakfast. Yeah. I uh, we, just FYI, we don't fast. We're yeah. not, but a lot of people do, so we like to talk about it. Yeah, a lot we're of not people against it necessarily. Swear by a lot of people it, swear by it. Some people are saying that it's not a good idea. Yeah. But she is saying it is a good idea. Yeah. Especially for women. And she's an expert, I would say, in the field. So some of the benefits. Other than fat loss. Fat loss and especially visceral fat around our abdomens, around our major organs. We know that it improves mental clarity because insulin levels are low. We know that it spikes human growth hormone, which helps us with lean muscle mass. We know that it induces something called autophagy. I will speak more about this in a second, but this is spring cleaning for the cells. It is only evoked when we are fasted, autophagy. We know that it lowers insulin levels, blood pressure, improves our cholesterol profile, and we know that it can reduce your risk for developing cancer, and Alzheimer's disease, which I like to call type three diabetes, if for no other reason we want to protect our brains. Interesting. But again, with those benefits, I feel that we see those benefits with our diet just by eating healthy. Yeah. We see, we get mental clarity and all these. Well, so it's not just through intermittent fasting. And and I'm still not sure about the the autophagy, which she was talking about. Mm-hmm. That goes back to what we were talking about with the longevity. Because that just means that your body eats old cells and cleans it up, basically, Mm. since it's starving. But again, you have to be having a reduced caloric intake as well. So just because you're not eating for 16 hours if you're shoving a bunch of bad food in your face. Yeah. (laughs) Two more clips. Uh, Who should avoid intermittent fasting? First and foremost... If you are a brittle diabetic or you have difficult to control diabetes, if you are a child, an adolescent, or age greater than 70, might not be the best strategy. If you are pregnant, if you have chronic heart issues, kidney or or renal issues, not the best strategy. If you have a history of a disordered relationship with food, whether it is um, anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating, might not be the best strategy because it can invoke those tendencies. And last but not least, Mm -hmm. if you have a low body mass index, you're frail, or you've recently been in the hospitalized like I was for 13 days, I'm not currently intermittent fasting. See, she's not even intermittent fasting. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm glad that she did address, you know, people that shouldn't intermittent fast. Oh, yeah. she's Yeah. And she brought up a good point with uh, people that have, Sorry, relationship mm-hmm. issues with food mm-hmm. because of especially as social media it becomes like a thing. You know, I'm fasting here are my pictures. So it becomes more of an, uh, uh, an obsession. Mm. And 
you know, it just exacerbates mental health issues. Yeah. And everything else that social media helps exacerbate. Right. Yeah. And we, and we mentioned this. Yep. How this the, yeah. The posting of your food, the gramming, all that leads to this obsession. And what are you going to eat? You know, when you're eating and then you, now you're not eating. Hmm. Yep. And from the chat, the only reason why we're covering this, everyone's doing this. Everybody. Intermittent fasting. Someone brought it up at dinner last night. They yeah. Said, oh, yeah. I've been intermittent fasting. And last clip, a little bit of a long one. What do you eat? Well, when you're, when you're fasting, we know we're not eating food, but you can absolutely consume things like filtered water, plain coffee, or tea. They will not break your fast. But when you're ready to eat, what do you eat? Now, I would be remiss if I did not mention that there are foods that are going to be more advantageous for you to consume when you're ready to break your fast. So I want you to focus on real whole foods. That's what your body needs, wants, and deserves. So I want you to purchase the best quality protein that your budget permits, ideally organic or pastured meat, wild caught fish. Healthy fats, so crucial, helpful for building healthy hormones, and also really important for satiety, making sure our taste buds light up, make us happy. I'm not part of the anti-fat brigade. Really, really important. 20 years ago, I might have told you not to eat fat, but now we know better. So I want you to focus on things like... That's so interesting. That sounds so similar to the keto mentality. Yeah. How eat all the fat you want, you're good to go, kind of thing. Continuing. Like avocados, coconut oil, grass-fed butter, and nuts. Really great healthy fats. Unprocessed carbohydrates. Ladies, absolutely crucial. If you're in perimenopause, the five to seven years before menopause, or you're in menopause, quality and quantity are crucial. So I want you to consume things like low glycemic berries, green leafy vegetables, squash, quinoa, sweet potatoes, as opposed to bread and pasta. Cautionary tale, I want you to limit sugar and alcohol. By that I mean I want you to not consume those things because they can offset all the good that you're doing. And lastly, keep yourself well hydrated. Alcohol could definitely offset a yeah. lot of things. Hey, luckily uh, cannabis doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Good old intermittent fasting. We'll still cover it. We're, we're still following it. Quinoa. Yeah, quinoa. Isn't that high in calorie? Isn't that uh, really high calorie? No, Isn't that it, why we don't eat it? It's a complex carbohydrate. Or do we just not eat it because it's crap? It tastes uh, bad. It, it's okay. We just don't eat it. Okay. <laughs> Fox Business, U.S. birth rate at 32-year low. Fewer babies born in America last year than at any time since Ronald Reagan. That is what's not... The birth rate is way, way down. It is. In 2018, 3.79 million births. That's down 2% from 2017, down four years in a row, 10 of the last 11. The reasons being given, including teenagers and unmarried women having fewer babies, lower Hispanic fertility rates, and the rise of women obtaining college degrees. What does this all mean? Well, the... The, the rise of women obtaining college yeah. degrees. Disturbing trend is that the fertility rate falling below the replacement yeah. level. In other words, the workforce becomes too small to support the growing retiree segment. It's a very troubling trend. As you've said before, we've seen it in Japan, Italy, and elsewhere. Uh, and it's not a good trend. I don't think we're there yet. But yeah. it's funny. <laughs> I don't think we're there yet as far as birth rates being an issue. But well, it's possible. I mean, we were t just talking about how people are having less sex. Mm -hmm. So. And this is what it leads to. Yeah, less sex. Less sex. You know, I think they need to look at Instagram and social media. It's all abortions. <laughs> well. Well, you know, people do have better access to birth control. So Yeah, that's, oh, well, yeah, good point. So better that does access help to more education. Mm -hmm. Interesting. They didn't yeah. talk about that on Fox. Oh, of course not. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> but, hey, we can talk about it here. We can talk about anything. Yeah, we don't have advertisers. You got to help support us because we, to, in order to do this every week, and we'd like to do it more. We just money. get more support. Yeah. We're working on doing it more. So, healthytalkshow.com slash support. 
or if you have Amazon Prime, you can always link it to your Twitch account, get a Twitch Prime, and yeah. subscribe to us for free. HealthyTalkShow.com slash support. Go to that bottom link that says Twitch Prime or whatever it says. Click on that. It'll tell you how to do it. Email me. Ask at HealthyTalkShow.com. I'll help you. Call me. We'll we'll figure it out together. It's a little difficult. Talking about abortion. And controversial topics. Yes. When does life begin? It might depend on your faith. P-R-I the world. Ran an interesting piece that I really enjoyed. Sister Agatha Munyanyi is a Catholic nun and a missionary from Zimbabwe. I met her at the annual Rally for Life in Washington, D.C. last year. She told me the issue of abortion is a controversial one in Africa, too. In my country, in Zimbabwe, it's illegal to abort. You are actually sent to prison for doing that. It's illegal. It's a crime. You are not allowed. And do you think this is a good idea? It's good. It's good because... It's good. Yeah. You know, we have no right to terminate life at any stage. At any stage, for many devout Christians, life begins at conception, and abortion is wrong. Interesting. Not so cut and dry around yeah. the world. So when does life begin? When does life begin? What about for Jewish? The question of when life begins goes all the way back to the Talmud, the original source in Jewish religious law. It describes the first stage of human life as conception, when the soul comes into the world. But the fetus at this point is referred to as mere matter, not fully human yet. Orthodox Rabbi Lila Kajdan says that all changes when the baby is born. There's an idea that the act of birth itself changes the status of the fetus from this non-person, this watery matter, to a person, to a nefesh to a person with a soul. Kajdan says some of these issues are still being debated by Jewish leaders and that Jewish law doesn't fit neatly into either the anti-abortion or pro-abortion rights camps. Very that's, interesting. That's confusing. Yeah. <laughs> Which, what are we supposed to believe? <laughs> really interesting. Islam? It's Celine Ibrahim. She's a Muslim chaplain at Tufts University. But the question of when life begins from an Islamic perspective is easier to answer. Scholars have the opinion that life does begin at conception, but they're considering not just the protection of an unborn life. Muslim scholars see childbearing as a blessing, but having kids is not an obligation. Contraception is permissible. There's some wow. disagreement on abortion, with some scholars being more strictly opposed to it. But many Muslim leaders would say there are legitimate reasons to decide to terminate a pregnancy up until 120 days after conception. Very. It's so funny how the religions all have different rules. Yeah, and that's yeah. the main argument against abortions in the United States. It always goes back to religion. But one more, yeah. one more Hindu, very short. Hindus believe that the fetus contains a reborn soul at a very early stage, and the scriptures prohibit abortion, but the procedure is still legal in India. Buddhists from different schools of thought also believe that life begins at conception, but there's disagreement in Buddhism about abortion. Some say it's murder. Others, including the Dalai Lama, emphasize that this is a very personal decision with unique circumstances. I like yeah. that. A very personal decision with unique circumstances. I mean, it just goes back to show that, you know, if these major religions can't even come to a consensus, yeah. how can we just have one law that... Because going to make everybody happy. Yeah. You know, that's the issue. And I, that's the problem with politics is all these abortion things just help polarize, but... Mm -hmm. It's very personal. If you don't want an abortion, don't get an abortion. Yeah. If you do, <laughs> if you want one, you should be allowed to go get one. Yeah. And it's, it's a decision you should be allowed to make. Well, what doesn't make sense is a lot of the research shows that people will still get abortions. They'll just get unsafe abortions. Yes. That's <laughs> and yes, yeah. Unsa yeah, unsafe methods, uncontrolled poisons. I've heard of herbal remedies for yeah. that too, herbal abortions that people have done. I mean, there's coat hangers yeah. or where women will try to throw themselves like against the stairs or against counters. To It's just not good. Yep. But yeah, a uh, question in the chat is abstinence only education still a thing in most states? Uh, I 
believe it varies on the state. But yeah, we have yeah. To, we'll definitely look at that. We'd probably have to look into. I know there's been Texas updates. probably still. Yeah. <laughs> California hasn't been that way in a very long time. And different religions are also contradictory in contraception. Mm. Uh, like Catholics, I don't think, are supposed to use contraception. But that stance may be changing in recent years. So there's just a lot of confusion. But, confusion, yeah. You know, again, personal issue. So. Yep. Let people decide. And let's still respect one another. Because there are a lot, a lot of confounding factors. Exactly. KMOV, St. Louis. Parents left grieving as suicide rates among children steadily rise. Statistics nationwide, the number of children and teenagers going to the hospital for suicide attempts has more than doubled in the last 10 years. And that information, according to the Centers for Disease Control and the St. Louis area, is no exception to this. So much so that St. Louis Children's Hospital is making big changes to put a stop to that tragedy. Moving on or carrying Kim on. Kim Quayle, the emergency director for St. Louis Children's Hospital, says the number of kids and teens coming into the ER for suicidal thoughts and attempts has gone up 10% every year for the last five years. We see very young children, surprisingly, sometimes as young as five or six years of age who say that they want to harm themselves. Director of Behavioral Health Mary Craddock says these rising rates do show one good trend. Someone has noticed. Someone has brought them to our care because they've noticed. So that's the good side. And when these kids come into the ER, there isn't a dedicated space for them to be treated. St. Louis Children's Hospital has plans to be part of the solution. By August, they will have a brand new inpatient psychiatric ward that will have 14 dedicated beds. Damn. That's crazy. Just on that report. That's crazy. Bah, geez. Anything on that study or any? Yeah. yeah. Well, the JAMA article is a little confusing, mm -hmm. actually, just because of how they reported it. Uh, so they said that there was an increase yep. of 31% uh, for male individuals and female suicide rates doubled. But then the way they compared them was kind of strange because they compared them uh, to each other, so mm -hmm. you didn't get absolute numbers. But the basic takeaway was that not only are females increasing, compared to men, so essentially the ratio is going down. But the women are turning to what would they call these more violent methods. So, you know, men usually pick the more violent methods of hanging or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, guns, anything that works, essentially, because yeah. usually more violent equals more successful, mm -hmm. while women have gone for poisoning in general. Yeah, and that but, can usually be flushed out and yeah, if caught in time. Right. But the problem is now they're turning to the violent methods, so now they're becoming more successful, which is also dangerous. So now, instead of you know women kind of having this warning suicide mm -hmm. first, and then maybe they get help, mm -hmm. they you know are successful, which is not good. No. But <laughs> what I thought was kind of an oversight on that is they didn't address well. What about the fact that men are successful? That's not a good thing either. Yeah, because because they're more focusing on the women's perspective that oh this is bad. Yeah, the hospital stay women. is not going to save the men if the men are successful in the suicide attempt. Right, and that's again the problem yeah. where we're not helping our men enough because well we're not helping people enough if well, they're ending up in the true. hospital for suicide attempts. No, but men that's are like typically the last, that's the last the resort. Life. Yeah, yeah, that's the last resort. Yeah. But they they didn't really address why this was happening. You know, everyone kind of suspects social media, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. again, it's hard to establish causation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it is Mental Health Awareness Month, so love and light, love one another. Email us, askguiltytalkshow.com. Help spread positivity. Yep, and love hugs and love for everybody. Yeah, you can always just send us a hug. Yeah. Ask a healthy talk show .com. Send us a hug. Tweet us a hug. A tweet us a hug. <laughs> uh, healthy talk show. Drop the W. You good? CBS Evening News. State laws causing confusion amid booming CBD business. I need two of the lip balms. Tell them Kaufman Bagan and her son Drayson sell CBD oils in their small Scottsdale shop. It has not only helped me, but it has helped numerous friends. It, there's nothing wrong with it. But here in Nebraska, 
the Attorney General calls cannabidiol, or CBD, an illegal drug, just like marijuana. So police shut the shop down. Oh, man, shut them down. The confusion about CBDs here in Scotts Bluff is just a reflection of a nation's patchwork quilt of laws. What's illegal here in Nebraska in some states, in other places, is just no big deal. Just look at a map where 10 states allow it, 18 others only with a prescription, 19 with no clear rule, and three that consider it illegal. Uh, 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 yeah. Take notes. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> Go pause. Look One at more a map time. where 10 states allow it, 18 others only with a prescription, 19 with no clear rule, and three. All right, those three white ones are the ones that you want to avoid. Yeah. Because it is clearly illegal, apparently. Idaho, I see you. Yes. And then they, Consider what, North Dakota? I and would, Nebraska. Dang. Don't go there. Illegal. I think. So there have been raids from New York to Texas by authorities who say it's a marijuana type drug. But CBD products come from a different plant, hemp. What fuels the confusion is that sometimes CBD products can have trace amounts of THC the ingredient in marijuana that gets people high. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. It's such a small percentage. Jeez. Proponents say CBD products, now an almost $600 million industry, can ease everything from aches and pains to stress. In the end, the county attorney in Scotts Bluff decided not to prosecute. In Nebraska, CBD oil is absolutely illegal at this time. So police chief Kevin Spencer faces something he's never seen. So what's the point of enforcing the law in Absolutely. your situation then? Absolutely. <laughs> There's no reason to enforce the law. That's so funny. Gonna... <laughs> That's pretty funny. It's it's pretty interesting though. All these different conflicting laws. It is yeah, creating a lot it of is confusion. Crazy confusion. It's confusing. Or what people are confused about, uh, just like traveling. Yeah. Because you, know, you could buy something in a legal state that mm -hmm. end up in a illegal and and you could go through a checkpoint or something yeah. and get busted for having a joint yeah. on you i didn't even know i'm sorry i just came from california i'm sorry I well then in california now they're not looking for weed when you board planes for example so lax yeah, yeah they won't so it's very confusing mm -hmm. and then we've also talked about with the banks how you know they can't use federal banks for this yeah. money and it's it's <laughs> It's just, just it seems like they're trying to really hurt this damn industry I know, still. It, but this industry. Really... But watch, everything's going to go away as soon as the big tobacco players, all the big players oh, get, yeah. get their foot in and they're actually concrete in, and they have a good stakehold in the marijuana industry. Then everything's going to go away. It's going to be, oh, yeah, it's all good now. It's yeah. all good now. Joint's $10. <laughs> weed bank. That's weed bank. Bitcoin. Ooh. Wenmo. Weedmo. When, Weedmo. Weed it's a Venmo. Like Weedmo. It. What do you yeah. think? I know a lot of marijuana operations that do business through. Venmo. Yeah, I've and uh, maybe they they won't be frozen. You know, we'll be more relaxed. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to support us, HealthyTalkShow dot com slash support. Yep. You Science can. Daily: Legal marijuana reduces chronic pain, but increases injuries and car accidents. In a review of more than twenty eight million hospital records from the two years before and after cannabis was legalized in Colorado, UCSF researchers found that Colorado hospital admissions for cannabis abuse increased after legalization in comparison to other states. But taking the totality of all hospital admissions and time spent hospitals into account, there was no appreciable increase after recreational cannabis cannabis was legalized. To understand the potential shifts in healthcare, Use resulting from widespread policy changes, Marcus and his colleagues reviewed the records for more than 28 million individuals in Colorado, New York, and Oklahoma from the 2010 from 2010 to 2014 healthcare cost and utilization project, which included 16 million hospitalizations. They compared the rates of healthcare utilization and diagnoses in Colorado two years before and two years after recreational marijuana was legalized in December 2012 to New York as geographically distant and urban state and to Oklahoma as geographically close and mainly rural state. The researchers found that after legalization, Colorado experienced a 10% increase in motor vehicle accidents, as well as a 5% increase in alcohol abuse and overdoses that result in injury or death. At the same time, the state saw a 5% decrease in hospital admissions for chronic pain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Fun. I don't know. So, and looking at some of the data, mm -hmm. if you flip to my screen, like admissions uh, per 1,000. Uh-oh, how do uh -oh. I zoom in? 
but basically it didn't look that bad. The weird thing was the alcohol increase. Yeah. So you can see that a little better. So mm-hmm. comparing, I mean, just tracking Colorado, this is admissions per 1,000. It mm-hmm. almost looks like it's decreasing yeah. overall. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing that I was also wondering about, mm-hmm. because around this time uh, we had ride sharing uh, start, you know, Uber, Lyft, and those have also been correlated with an increase in traffic a- accidents. So, I mean, yeah. I'm not exactly sure if we can, you know, if we have a smoking gun here. But they they do mention what the, the other thing I found funny, though, is they mention how people are uh, have decreased need for pain now, mm-hmm. which, you know, something we've mentioned. So maybe the pharmaceutical. Oh, yeah, pain goes away since yeah. you're smoking marijuana. Yeah, but now now the drug companies aren't going to be happy <laughs> <No>. about this. <laughs> yeah, they see that part. Whoa, 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 yeah. whoa, yeah. whoa. And I. That's why maybe there's been so many issues with cannabis mm-hmm. legalization. Yep. Smoking gun. Yeah. We're t- Here's a good one. We actually talked about this last week, but Democracy Now! did a much better piece on it. Bottle of lies. How poor FDI oversight and fraud in generic drug industry threaten patients' health. Looking at an explosive new investigation that exposes widespread... Explosive new investigation. Smoking gun unsafe conditions in many Indian and Chinese factories that manufacture generic drugs that comprise nearly 90 percent of the pharmaceutical drug supply in the United States. Nearly 80 percent of the active ingredients of all drugs, brand or generic, as well as almost all antibiotics, are made outside of the United States. That's crazy. Yeah. Because first uh, it was a generics, but now it's saying, no, all, yeah. <laughs> not just generics. Now I'm a, you know, little concerned. Mm-hmm. Crap, lost my spot. Oh. Nearly 80% of the United States. Generic drugs Sorry. are, of course, cheaper this. than brand name drugs. But in her new book, Bottle of Lies, the inside story of the generic drug boom, journalist Catherine Eban works with two industry whistleblowers to expose how many overseas manufacturers are cutting corners at the cost of quality and safety. This comes as the U.S. Food and Drug Administration just issued its own update on the state of pharmaceutical quality that found the drug quality of factories in India and China scored below the world average. FDA officials say that's because more robust inspections have uncovered problems. Two factories in China and India were linked to recalls of the commonly prescribed blood pressure drugs Losartan and Valsartan, after Uh testing revealed the drugs were tainted with possible carcinogens. The report prompted the the FDA's director of drug evaluation and research to conclude, quote, the quality of the drug supply has never been higher. Never. Wait, I know, I, I know. But that's Where, what are they basing that off? Of? <laughs> Quality's never been higher. Uh, a bottle of lies. Explain active ingredients. Also explain what active ingredients means. Right. Again, nearly eighty percent of all active ingredients uh-huh. in all drugs, brand right. or generic, are made outside the United States. And Almost all antibiotics mm-hmm. are made outside the United States. Right. So active ingredient is the key ingredient in the drug. It is the sort of synthesized molecule that makes the drug effective. It's the central, the central element of the drug that uh, has the effect on the person. So if active ingredient, what's common, an active ingredient will be manufactured in China. It will be shipped to India. An Indian manufacturer will make the finished dose, and then it will arrive at our pharmacy. And, of course, that is invisible to the consumer. Wait, what? They're shipping these things all around, yeah. too? Yeah, China to India. Yeah. That's also oh, a yeah. little disturbing. How the investigation started. It started in 2008, so a decade ago. And I was contacted by a, an NPR radio show host, Joe Graydon. He runs a show called The People's Pharmacy. He was concerned because patients were writing into his show, calling in, and saying that they had symptoms, uh, in some cases devastating symptoms, after being switched to certain generics. 
Uh, and those complaints greatly concerned uh, Joe Graydon, because there was a lot of commonality between them. A lot of patients were complaining about similar or the same drugs. They were complaining about um, time-release drugs, so those are slightly more complex. Um, some of them were suicidal after being switched to antidepressants. Uh, some of them were having seizures after taking epilepsy drugs. And he had been sending these complaints to the FDA, and basically the and the FDA said, we're going to take care of it. We're going to investigate these claims because we care about the taxpayers and the citizens. Sure. <laughs> response he got back was that everything is fine. So he really felt that somebody with, as he told me, and I saved my notes from that call, um, he wanted somebody with investigative firepower to look into them. Very interesting. Ooh, the plot thickens. Now we're going to learn about Peter Baker. So, uh, Peter Baker was a 32-year-old FDA investigator. Uh, they were called consumer safety officers. And in 2012, the FDA looked around and asked, would any of its investigators like to uh, relocate overseas to their poorly staffed uh, remote offices in India or China uh, to investigate the drug plants making our generic drugs? And Peter Baker is a motorcycle-riding, tattooed, a uh, tough guy who was up for an adventure, but he had another reason that he wanted to volunteer, which was that uh, the, by reputation, Indian manufacturers were market leaders in aseptic manufacturing, which is the very demanding manufacturing of making sterile drugs. So he volunteered to relocate huh. and wound up in New Delhi. Cool. Little intro there. Right. Now, Peter Baker continued. So he started investigating these plants, and uh, he had a different way of investigating than a lot of FDA investigators. He skipped the guided tours and the opening slideshows, and he went right to the quality control labs. Wait, wait, wait. Are these tours announced in advance? That is one <laughs> of the big problems. The FDA announces its inspections overseas in advance. Some Back. Uh, we'll revisit that later. That's a good one. Yeah. Sometimes giving two months advance notice to plants that they are coming. And so what does that mean? What can they do in that amount of time? They can do a lot. I mean, yeah. as one investigator said, uh, give them a weekend, they can put up a building. <laughs> but Dang. basically the accusation is that these plants overseas are staging their inspections. And one of the remarkable findings in my book is that they literally have data fabrication teams that come in in advance of these inspections shred documents, fabricate documents, invent quality data, invent standard operating procedures, uh, all in advance of the FDA's <laughs> Invent arrival. standard operating. Which SOPs would you like to see, the fake yeah. ones or the real ones? Yeah. That's <laughs> the ones the... we wrote just for you or the ones we actually use? Wait, how, how are they making these drugs anyways without proper yeah. SOPs? That's yeah. really bad mm -hmm. and really disturbing. Mm -hmm. Isn't, I mean, uh, the whole point of these drugs is they need to be precise yes. and mm -hmm. standard. Consistent. That's why you can't buy Canadian drugs, according to... Yeah, because they're so unsafe. Yeah, they're so apparently. unsafe. More one clips? of the first plants Peter Baker inspected. Um, one of the first plants that he went into was a company called Wachart. And uh, this was a sterile manufacturing plant where, you know, the quality controls are incredibly strict, down to employees having to move very deliberately and slowly so as not to disturb the airflow in the plant. It's that strict and regulated. What? I don't know. That sounds kind of weird if you have to move slowly. It yeah. sounds like your airflow is not proper. Well, if you can't, you can't walk by anything too quickly. I would just, maybe yeah. that's what it would be. Cause I I've know. walked by things quickly and I've blown... And very, yeah, I've gone to some very sensitive places. They don't touch anything. Walk slow. Do not come into contact with anything. Do not touch anything kind of thing. Well, let's see what he found. <laughs> uh, and it was his second day of the inspection. He was in a hallway, and he saw an employee at the other end of this long, brightly lit hallway with a clear garbage bag. And the man was walking in a furtive manner. Uh, and as soon as the employees saw Peter Baker and his colleague, a microbiologist, he turned around and started walking the other way again. Oh. And uh, uh. Uh, the microbiologist yelled, stop. The man broke into a run. Oh, my he gosh. He tossed the garbage bag under a stairwell. And Peter Baker opened the garbage bag and found 
75 torn batch records, which indicated that insulin the company was manufacturing was contaminated with metallic particles. What? But nonetheless yeah. had been released to patients. That's horrible. In India and the Middle East. Um, so mm -hmm. Peter Baker's only responsible for U.S. medications, but he followed the trail of these documents. He went to this area of the plant, which had not been disclosed to the FDA, and he found what? the plant was manufacturing a sterile injectable cardiac drug on the same equipment that had created the metallic particles. Uh, so he basically exposed deep fraud in this plant. I like how they have separation. These countries get this stuff. We'll do better for the United States. Uh, hopefully. But not much better. Uh, yeah. yeah, hopefully better. That's... <laughs> But, but then that's also very unethical. Like yeah. We're we'll poison over. these people, but. Yeah, that, that's fine. We don't care. No, what? Oh, oh, man. That's so disturbing. Uh, last long clip. What Peter Baker found in five years. In the course of five years, he inspected 86 plants in India and China, and he found some aspect of data fraud or deception at 67 of those plants really almost four-fifths of the plants that he inspected. And he, Repeat that. Or, he, found, <laughs> he found some element of data fraud or data deception in almost four-fifths of the plants that he inspected. over Four-fifths. That's 80 percent. That's outrageous. Yeah. Overseas in India and China. Um, That's a B. <laughs> For B your minus. drugs. Yeah. And he did it with a completely different inspection method. Instead of looking at the records that the plant was giving him, he went into the manufacturing plant's computer systems, and he started looking at uh, deleted uh, audit trails. And, and he tracked the metadata in the computer systems and realized that in many of these plants, they were conducting what are called pretests. They were doing an initial offline screen of the drugs uh, to see what the quality was, and then potentially making alterations to the tests so that what? when they retested the drugs in the official system of the plant. Yeah. Wait, I like how they altered the test and not, you know, fixing the actual issues. Yeah. No, 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 no. We're not going to fix No. No. We just run the test as a formality so we could show you this piece of paper. Look, it's tested. Oh, we man. ran the test. It's tested. <laughs> they would pass uh, quality quality tests. And what happened to Peter Baker? He left the agency in March. Uh, he, based on the experiences he had in India, he was followed. He was threatened. In one instance, he was poisoned with tainted water at a plant. Uh, some of the oh investigators gosh. that he worked with were spied on. A hotel room was bugged. Uh, and based on this sort of aggregate experience, he was actually diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. Oh, my gosh. He, That's horrible. He messed with the legal drug dealers who were probably worse than the, you know, think about it. The oh. <laughs> Everyone's afraid of the cartels, but they operate still illegally, you know. Uh, but <laughs> At least he, with the cartels, you really know what you're getting into. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have one last clip. Announced inspections. A minute on that. One of the huge problems, as we discussed, is that the inspections by the FDA are announced two months in advance. And remarkably, the FDA even turns to these plants to arrange local travel, to arrange hotel ground transportation. And so what happens is that the inspectors arrive. They're uh, picked up at the airport in a luxury car. They're taken to a hotel where their rooms are magically upgraded and they never see a bill. There are trips to the Taj Mahal, shopping trips, massages, golf outing. Hookers. Sign me up. No. Uh, a system that, um, as one of my sources called it, regulatory tourism. And the problem is when the FDA says our, our drug supply has never been safer, they are discounting the fact that the findings of the plants are in this system of pre-announced inspections. Wow. So what's even the point of uh, these inspections? 
other than the inspector getting a free vacation. Yeah. There is. <laughs> oh, this is bad. I like that yeah. Democracy Now! actually went into this report because we ran this this report on this book last week and it wasn't this thorough. Yeah. It was very, very hands off. But then uh, my other question is mm-hmm. why, why we manufacture so many drugs overseas i assume it must just be that much cheaper but yeah but is it it's that's something that our population consumes yeah that's the issue and we're taking the fda's they're letting the company set up the trips and arrange everything that is stupid that is stupid i mean they know exactly where you're gonna be and Mm -hmm. they schmooze you either way you're already biased you know what's funny because I have experience in food safety. Yeah. So I have experience with two auditing firms, AIB and Siliker. Both of these firms, you schedule them to come out to audit you. So you know when they're going to come. Mm-hmm. The 30-day window, you know, and you pay them to come out. One of the firms, I won't say which one, they don't really look at things. They just look at the records you provide them. They say, I want to see all these binders. I can oh, fabricate weird. a nice binder. No yeah. problem. <laughs> so, that's a, It seems like these auditors are just... Getting a little lax across the board, maybe. And that's food safety, so that's... Yeah, it's kind of disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> we were dealing with but, product that... Direct food product stuff, so it's... Yeah. I don't know. But, I mean, drugs. Yeah, drugs. Manufactured <laughs> overseas. You know, I thought you were a little paranoid not wanting to put all these things in your body, but... I told I you. I, I told you. I don't know where they come from. I and, know. And now, I hello, I'm proof is in the pudding. We don't know, know where they're coming from. You think you're taking something and you're getting who knows what crap and yep. other doses, wrong doses. Mm-hmm. But the problem is this has fatal consequences sometimes. Mm-hmm. Worst case scenario. Or you're just not being properly medicated. It's mm-hmm. terrible. I, I guess we have to get our own little mask back at home or something. <laughs> Hey, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> That'd be good. Healthytalkshow.com slash support. If yes. You want to help pay for <laughs> Are we good? Ready to round off the show? I think so. Hopefully you learned a lot. Yep. Knowledge is power. Hopefully you learned a lot. Thanks for tuning in. Reach out to us. Ask at healthytalkshow.com. Instagram and Twitter, Healthy Talk Show. Drop the W. Leave us a voicemail over at 509-878-3229. And healthytalkshow.com slash discord. Love and light. Love and light.